In the last lesson, we talked about some of the compromises the Founding Fathers had to come with, up with, especially compromises between large states and small states, and between uh, non-slaveholding states in the North and slaveholding states in the South. Today, we're going to talk about some of the ideas, the ideas behind the Constitution. You know, our Founding Fathers did not create this entirely from scratch. Um, they did a lot of research. You know, Thomas Jefferson was uh, our ambassador to Paris at the time, and James Madison, as you might remember, was called the father of the Constitution, wrote him and said, hey, send me any information that you have, books. Jefferson sent him hundreds and hundreds of books about uh, different governments, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, European governments. So our founding fathers had a lot of information to base their new idea of how a government uh, should be operated. What our founding fathers wanted to create was a republic, a republic. And that's a government in which citizens rule themselves through elected representatives. It's not really a democracy, you know, uh, in, uh, in a fashion. A true democracy is where every single person would have a vote uh, for everything. Now, obviously, not every single person can go to, uh, to the polls every single day. So we have representatives, people that the citizens themselves elect to represent them. So we are a republic, a government which the citizens rule themselves through people that we elect. Um, if you think, think about it, could uh, you or your parents be able to be uh, at local town meetings or down in Lincoln every single day to vote on bills or in Washington? Well, obviously, just the logistics behind that is just not feasible. So we have people that we elect to represent us at the state, well, at the local, state, and national level. And so that's what a republic is. Our founding fathers were really influenced a lot by Rome. A lot of them looked almost romantically at Rome. Almost, in a way, over-exaggerated the idea between, behind the Roman Republic. But... Here's what Rome influenced our founding fathers. First of all, the people of Rome during the Republic, this is before Caesars, uh, they believed in independence. They believed in independence. They also believed in public service. They thought that a good citizen of Rome should serve the Republic, not for money necessarily, because it's the right thing to do. And the people themselves were devoted. They sacrificed. They worked hard for the good of the Republic. Okay, so some of the, those are the, some of the positive influences of Rome. But our founding fathers also looked at Rome as a warning. Warning. Rome's republic collapsed. In fact, most republics had not lasted for very long. Our founding fathers want to create a republic that will stand the test of time. So they look at Rome's republic as a warning. And Rome collapsed, or Rome's republic collapsed because of dictatorship. Dictatorship. Uh, the Senate had given away its power, and the people allowed one man, a Caesar, to take over. So the Republic could not survive if people remained, uh, if they did not remain dedicated to the idea of being independent. Rome gave up that luxury of being independent, and they turned over the power to a Caesar, to a dictator. All right? They also really got into, and you studied this in seventh grade, some of the ten warnings of, the, uh, of Rome. You know, um, they had uh, collapse of the morals, a uh, life of luxury, not dedicated to the Republic. Few were willing to serve in the army. Rome had to go out and hire mercenaries to protect their borders. So there's lots of things. And these are warnings that we should also pay attention to today. Um, People need to be dedicated to the idea of serving our country, all right? Uh, not for money, but because it's the right thing to do. I also would argue that uh, maybe it would not be a good idea to make it a career, to be a career politician, that you might want to go and serve your country for a limited amount of time and then turn it over to the next person. But, you know, that's just my opinion. So, again, uh, Rome served as a warning. Uh, they gave up their independence to a dictator, to Caesar. 
Besides Rome and Greece, they really looked at Britain. Even though they'd been in a war with Britain, and they weren't particularly fond of Britain at the time, they actually admired Britain's tradition of freedom. The first thing that uh, they looked at was the Magna Carta. And if you remember the Magna Carta, that was signed by King John. And uh, it's the idea that the king himself even has to obey the laws. The Magna Carta uh, that King John was forced to sign said that he would consult the noblemen and the church before he raised taxes. Um, the rights of the noble, the noblemen were later extended uh, to other classes of people. And you also have to remember the English Bill of Rights. And that happened in the glorious revolution under William and Mary. But the English Bill of Rights grants even more freedoms to the people. It gave them the right to um, uh, bear arms. It gave them the right to vote for the parliament in a regular fashion. It also gave the right of habeas corpus. In other words, they're not going to be thrown into jail without being first charged for a specific crime. So our founding fathers did look at Britain for some of the traditions of freedom that Britain had long fought for. Many of our founding fathers were also influenced by the Enlightenment period. And the Enlightenment period was the idea that uh, people could improve society uh, through, using, uh, through use of reason. If you use reason, the society would be Im improved. Um, one of the most important people that uh, our founding fathers looked at was a guy named John Locke. John Locke wrote a, a, a pamphlet in 1690 called The Treaties of Government. And his Treaties of Government argued the idea of natural rights. Natural rights, you remember those. But his were life, liberty, and property, right? If you remember in the Declaration of Independence, ours is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't think property is such a big deal in America because there's lots of land, lots of people can purchase land, lots of people can get land. But in Europe in 1690, property was owned by the noblemen for the most part. So um, John Locke, his, his natural rights were life, liberty, and property. But he goes on further and says that... Uh, Government really is the agreement between the ruler and the ruled. That uh, the ruler has to protect the citizens and to protect their natural rights of life, liberty, and property. And if he does not, then the ruled, the people, the people that he rules, have the right to get rid of them, to overthrow it. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Jefferson was very much influenced by the Enlightenment age. Um, remember... Um, our founding fathers in Benjamin Franklin and all those guys, the guys that signed the Declaration of Independence, and Thomas Jefferson, who was the primary author, argued that if a government fails to protect your natural rights, then it's the people's right and duty to get rid of that government and start a new one. And I think that really goes back to John Locke. Another very important Enlightenment author was a guy named Montesquieu. He's the Baron de Montesquieu of France. And he wrote a book in 1748 called The Spirit of the Laws, all right? Which he, you know, kind of sets up how government should be uh, constructed. And one that I think is, is amazing, because we follow it almost to the letter, was the idea that Montesquieu comes up with the separation of powers. He argues that the government should have three branches, okay? And guess what branches he thinks we should have? That's the executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. So this idea that we came up with in the Constitution was nothing new. Montesquieu had come up with this in 1748. And he believed that separation of powers is important. And we're going to get into this in greater detail in the next lesson. But the three branches of power, they have uh, basically provides checks and balances so that no single branch can become too powerful. The other two branches would make sure... The executive isn't, uh, doesn't have too much power, or um, the other two branches might say that the legislative branch has too much power, and they can check and balance it. So Montesquieu also heavily influences our founding fathers when they set up our government. All right, so there you have it. We've talked about some of the influences, especially from Rome, Britain, and from the Enlightenment. In the next section, we are going to talk about uh, how the Constitution is going to be ratified, and there's going to be some states 
that aren't too happy with it because they're going to demand something else. They're going to demand a Bill of Rights.